a number of you have have experience with hypothesis uh, already in the room. Um, I tapped a few folks to uh, share their stories ex uh, explicitly as part of this roundtable. But if you have your own stories to tell, uh, the way this is going to work is that each person is going to take five minutes up here, tell some stories, some takeaways, some challenges, some hopes for the future in terms of annotation and teaching and learning, um, all under five minutes. After each person, we'll talk as a group for five minutes. You can ask them questions, um, but that's also a chance for you to share your own uh, experiences with annotation. Um, and then after you know, five people go for uh, you know, those 10 minute chunks, we'll have five, uh, 10 minutes at the end for broad discussion. So if you have your own stories to tell, please do, um, you know, do so uh, at, those, at those opportunities. But I think if folks are ready, um, we'll just jump right in and, and start with Anne. Hi, I'm Ann Oberman, and I'm from Metropolitan State University of Denver. And I'm using Hypothesis uh, currently in a course, and so I teach social work, um, and we're using it for an online groups and family course. And so I'm teaching people how to do therapeutic and case management groups, and also do family therapy. Um, and so we implemented Hypothesis, really, um, it was part of a couple other folks that were doing it at Metro, and I, I'm the online coordinator in our program. And so we wanted to see how it worked and to see how it engaged students um, in some really difficult texts that we were reading. Um, so I said, sure, I'll try it. Um, and I am so glad I did uh, because comments that students have been giving me are, it's like having sitting down and having coffee with you, Anne. That was one of the first comments that I got during a week. And usually I hear, do we have to do another discussion board? Like this is such busy work. And the insight that even within the first um, annotation or within the first article that they were reading, the, the insight and the dialogue that they were giving each other was already rich. And I was thinking, I'm gonna have to model this for a while. I'm gonna have to share, walk them through it. Instantly, it was almost innate, the way they were interacting um, with the text. And so I just like to open with that because it just felt really amazing with the, we're having coffee. Um, in, in speaking or in listening to Manuel and thinking about some of the more social justice pieces, I really think that using hypothesis, hypothesis has decentered me as the instructor which is hard to do when you're online teaching because you're delivering or it's, it's very centered with the instructor. Um, and so oftentimes within the reading, I will provide prompts and I'll say, hey, pay attention to this or do that. But most of the time I just leave it for the students and what they come up with and the way they take readings and turn them, um, whether it's applying to their social work practicums or what they're doing in real, real life or their family, um, they take those uh, readings and put it in a complete different direction. And so I've really just appreciated um, the decentering of myself, the, the creation of community. That's often a complaint of our social work faculty is I'm not connected with my students. I don't know how to connect. And the intimacy that's created with the annotations um, is instant. Um, and you see in the annotations, people asking each other, oh, this reminds me of your, stu your kid or how are they feeling? I mean, in the annotations, they're having these dialogues um, which some of my faculty, some of my other faculty were like, yeah, but that's not the point of the reading. I said, it's the exact point of the reading is that they're, when they're reading, they're thinking of each other in their own lives and integrating that in. Um, so those were just a couple of those takeaways. I'm trying to think of anything else that I really wanted to share. Um, oh, just teaching students how to read. So a lot of our bachelor students that are coming in junior year, they don't know how to read research articles. And so just really dissecting and being able to say, okay, what is this? And you have a voice in this. And students are actually disagreeing with the reading, which they don't do in class as much, or they don't do in the readings, they're reading them outside when they come into class or disagreeing with me. Um, they don't do that. But in these annotations, they're disagreeing. Or they'll say, actually, Anne, I don't think that. Um, which is, again, different. And maybe it's the way I'm presenting in my class, but that I feel like hypothesis has allowed them to disagree, to decenter me, to center themselves. Um, some of the things I'm thinking about with future use is really within social work, we work a lot with the community, so other social work practitioners, because we're training them to be professionals. Um, and so opening those annotations to their supervisors and their field placements, to other professionals, and then to other participants or clients they're working with. And so how cool to read an article about um, building resiliency in adult chronic mentally ill um, males, and then to be able to have men that they're working with annotate an article right along with them. And so I was thinking how important that would be, and even with Mandel thinking of participatory research. So taking that D2L and then doing some amazing qualitative in that layering um, of, of annotation that you could do within participatory research and kind of blowing up in that access um, to that process after they figure out their tags and after they do that. So that's some of the directions that 
we see social work um, going in. And one of the last ones that I love is students say it doesn't feel like busy work. And I, again, I know, I mean, and, and Jeremy said this in the intro, but you know where students are at and I know what they're thinking. And they're like, this isn't busy work. And they are writing, I don't grade my annotation. So it's part of discussion group that I'm trying to change the way I grade. And so they simply get graded for being in there. It doesn't matter when they do it during the week. It doesn't matter how much they do it. And I'd say that 50% of the class is, I mean, like I'll get with a class of 22, I'll get, you know, 200, 300 annotations in one reading. Um, and so they don't even, it's not even the incentive of the grade that they're just, they're participating and they're in there. Um, so those are a couple of my uh, antidotes to, to the usage of it and just really excited to continue using it. Um, another colleague uses it in her in-person classes um, and loves it because they're coming to class prepared and they've already had this dialogue. So the intimacy level and their preparation levels have increased. Thanks. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try to keep this going, but I want to have five minutes to, to talk. Uh, if you've done something similar to Anne or you have questions about uh, Anne's project and aspects of it, this is the time people on the panel can participate as well. It's just open discussion. We'll have these little open breaks in between. I um, work with most recently at like a R1 place, which is different from the community college that I was in. I'm just curious. Uh, these people are very interested in research, right? So is there research and is anybody going after research? Yeah, and I'll just add to that. I actually got an email this morning uh, that uh, somebody who used annotation in a classroom at Southwestern College or University in Texas uh, sent me the preprint of an article that she was going to get published. So it's starting to come together. And I think actually I had the inspiration this morning that the next hypothesis webinar is going to be something that research and annotation and bring together some of the folks that are working on that and sharing the results of it. Um, and has this completely replaced discussions for you within the classroom? Not in this, so this is the first time I've tried it, but I think it will. Um, so the discussion, I feel like the discussions are having, and because I can post annotations and ask questions throughout um, that they can choose to respond to. So if I wanted to guide that or had specific topics, I could do that also in the annotations. So it will, but this, at this point, I was using annotation and Flipgrid. So we, but that was because they're doing modeling skills. And so we had the videos, but those were, I was doing annotation and Flipgrid as my only discussion activities. Yeah. So and I, I also don't grade um, my students' annotation contributions when they're participating in the class of stuff. Um, maybe that also can answer your question. I have entirely flipped that for all of the discussion. And I'm wondering if you, Tell your students that you're not grading their annotations. One, how do they respond? Mm -hmm. And two, what strategies do you have to then encourage more kind of inherently motivated, dare I use the term authentic conversation when they know that they're just as I think you said, they're just kind of just supposed to show up, mm -hmm. they're not performing to a grade. So how do you manage that? Yeah. So I, I feel like whenever I start going into that territory of not grading, there's a lot of discomfort and the students respond, what do you mean? I want to know how many posts, by what time, how long do they need to be? Do I need to use APA formatting? And so that initial response is always a little bit of that resistance and fear, I think. Um, and then when I get in there and I'm posting pictures of my cat making, I mean, like I'll kind of uh, model informality, um, then they start to engage. It, I would say it takes the first couple of weeks because students will post at 11.59 on Saturday night. And so no one gets to respond to them. And so then commenting later during the, the next week, oh, you know what, Jeremy made this great comment at the last minute, you know, and I, mean, and I am a little cheeky about, you know, and people didn't get to see it. And so I wonder um, what that would look like in this context. So I'll bring things back to try to create that culture of responding. But I find that, um, the not majority, about half of those students have that self-motivation and are engaged. And the others, when I respond to comments and I say, oh, tell me more about that, or can you respond to that next week? They do. And so I feel like the relational piece draws them out to create a little bit more of that self-learning. Um, I also try to choose really meaty texts that are controversial. Um, so I feel like that helps with that engagement piece. Um, but I've been, I mean, faculty ask me all the time about the grading piece and how, well, I, no, you get equal points, whether it's Jeremy's comment 1159 or Remy's 25 annotations. 
Um, and it balances out. And students really like the flexibility. I mean, when they say, yeah, my kid was sick all week. I didn't get to post this week. And so it made me feel great that I didn't have to do that. You're right. I'm so phased by this like webcam. I'm so glad I trimmed my nose hairs this morning. Uh, hi, I'm Jonathan Lashley. I'm from Boise State University. Uh, I found out today through Lego that I also want to fight people, but also communicate equally effectively. So thank you, Janet, for that. Um, but part of it is because I, I have multiple roles in my institution. Um, I'm the senior instructional technologist for the university. So I think about instructional technology and its use a lot. Uh, I recently completed a PhD in learning sciences. So I think about the science of learning a lot. And I teach first year writing part time. And so I think about writing and how we communicate effectively and exchange values with others on a regular basis. And, and so I have a few different stories to tell in my brief five minutes. Uh, the first of which is last year, Boise State's first year writing program was undergoing a curriculum redesign. And uh, as I'm prone to do, if you're gonna make changes, you, want, you might as well make all the changes. And so uh, in this particular case, the, the class I was teaching in the fall was based on genre. And specifically the major like capstone project was evaluating, writing an evaluative report of some online genre of media. Uh, in which case, Hypothesis was one of those tools that I love because it just got out of the way in that it was already simulating exactly what I want students to do and what I've, I've tried to do as a first year writing instructor for years. Things like co-authoring my syllabus with them, things like having good structured peer review, uh, having a place to keep and attract and select resources and file them away and take notes and annotate all the things that we've heard a lot about today. And what I found was a number of things. And, and just to kind of brush up before today's presentation, since I've been working on dissertation instead of teaching this semester, I was going through my course evaluations and I forgot how much I appreciated them. And then thinking about the lens of hypothesis, I appreciated them even more today because I was going through and learning about the most valuable things the students took away from my class. And there were things like class discussions and practicing writing and interrogating writing and reading with other people. And all of this was stuff they did with hypothesis or was augmented through hypothesis. Um, as you were talking about, students would come to class and the discussion had already been taking place on this platform uh, with me, with their colleagues. Uh, I started pulling further and further week, away as weeks went on because they were structuring conversations themselves. And also the space was designed around active learning. We had little small group tables where they built, you know, they built bonds. I shake them up throughout the semester, but they didn't matter. Uh, it, it completely changed the way discussion happens in a very discussion heavy class like first year writing. And they were building knowledge. They, they were co-constructing knowledge, which is exactly what I've wanted to see. It also really problematized the expectations I've had in the past about what is working and what's not within class discussion, what participation looks like in a class, but also uh, even better, and I, I guess this kind of goes to answer some of uh, Ramey's question as well about grading. I, I'm a contract grader. I do contract grading in class. Students need to come to me throughout the semester and especially at the end to validate their participation, what that looked like and, and justify the grade that they earned in my class based off the rubrics that we co-construct. And they had all of this knowledge stuck in one place, whether they posted a hundred times, whether they posted five times, and they were just five really thoughtful cases, they could go back to these materials and reference them and contextualize them and build a narrative. And these are all the things we want to teach them in first year writing in terms of developing critical thinking skills. Um, and, and I mean, even just the idea of going through some of these readers or articles and allowing students to ask questions that they would maybe feel uncomfortable or embarrassed to ask in class about what does this word mean? or why would they write this way, or why would they start a sentence this way? Uh, it, it just changed the nature of the scope of, of the assignment. And actually, I, I like those kinds of questions so much in the last couple weeks in class, because we just changed curriculum, because my course is entirely based in OER, uh, I actually had a small list of press books that I asked students to go through and said, listen, you all have read the concepts, you know what's worked for you this semester, what hasn't in terms of learning the outcomes of this class. I want you to go through with hypothesis and help me vet these materials. And so they were able to just pull up a press book, find a chapter that seemed interesting to them on a concept that they wanted to learn more about and talk to whether or not they appreciate it, whether they thought it was helpful, whether they think that I should use it in the future 
of the classes. And so the role of student was modified because I was able to just continue to do what I already always do, but I wasn't relegated behind the walled garden of say, just using Google Apps products or some other product mechanism. It was all just web-based, so that's really cool. A couple other just short stories I have. One is as a co-author and co-editor of an open source book, uh, that came, or open access book that came out last year. Uh, right after it was published by uh, Pacific University Press, my co-authors and I got an email from one of our authors. And she was concerned because some edits that she had put in a few months prior, they weren't realized. And so we contacted the press and everyone was really concerned because here it is, it's been published. And, and they're like, oh, we're on it, we're on it, we're getting on this. And immediately I thought, Surely this is going to happen again. I can think of one other author in our book who just got married, and so she changed her last name. And there's an open access book. This is CC BY. This should be edited. And so a project I'm really excited about now that the dissertation is behind me is that I can facilitate what I've, what I've deemed the editor's cut that's currently hosted in um, Boise State Press books of OER, a field guide for academic librarians, where hypothesis is already enabled in that platform. People can go in and comment and we can adjust that manuscript to be more relevant, to be more accurate, to provide better resources and access to our authors that we spent the last few years collecting. And so, you know, I'm a big OER nerd, open education nerd, and so a tool like this is really helpful to see the sort of practicality and the transformation of those materials to be more relevant in our realm, which is great. Last story is, um, I can't remember, so it's fine. That's it, <laughs> I'm done. Oh, that's what it was. Uh, yeah, I just wrote a dissertation, small, you know, casual writing exercise. And uh, it's great because back in the fall, if I was to try and remember or find the paper notes I had, or even find the digital notes on my laptop, when it's impossible. And so hypothesis, I've been using it throughout my, re my revision process, my research process, and it allows me to remember who I was back then. And that's okay, so thanks guys. Can you talk a little more about contract reading and what that means uh, and how the hypothesis plays? So also, just maybe give us a definition because it's a pretty radical approach to grading that maybe not everybody is familiar with. Yeah, I, I find grading problematic, um, especially in general education courses. Uh, I, I see it in myriad ways, but my students are slaves to a letter grade. Uh, they, they come in that way. What I've seen materialize even more the longer I've been teaching, I've been teaching for about a decade, a decade now, is uh, how often students want to script the curriculum where I'm giving them a list of things to do, and they go through that list and they check off boxes. And I feel like the logic of teaching engineering is like checking off those boxes to get that particular grade without being assigned to the central rubric. And so, at least in first year writing classes, um, folks like Peter Elbow and others who use contract grading. They see it as this is reflective of the kind of skills you want them to gain as well. So to think about what is the scope of the class to try and understand that upfront, and to keep modifying that understanding, which work through writing, and negotiate that because ultimately that's far more reflective of the experience they're going to have in life than reaching some sort of other grade or pre-assess and expecting that all these students are going to have the exact same experience. Because there's one thing I learned about discussions that are augmented through hypothesis. Is that learners we, we know this, we've learned this, like we're writing and research for years, that learners have different experiences and they're going to engage with different contexts and different ways. And so that's all contract grading is. Um, I, I recommend you look it up. But I mean, in my class, I, I do it differently. I think everyone does does, uh, where students have an initial contract and then after every major assignment, they're able to go through and kind of revise it. We devote some course, some class time, and some uh, time in the semester to reflecting and compiling artifacts and evidence. And so, again, a tool like hypothesis is really helpful because they're going through and they're, they're reflectively writing and reading and commenting for their own benefit, but also for others' benefit. So, to have that record to have that evidence is really helpful. Uh, you mentioned, Jonathan, that you had. Uh, Notice something different about, or you had reassess your thinking about how discussions were going to be had by using presentation. I was curious, what is it that you discovered about this thing? 
Yeah, so I, I haven't replaced my in-class discussions. Um, and part of that is because of not only the assessments I do throughout the semester to kind of engage what students are like in the mailbox and about the class. I taught first year writing a number of times, but I've learned about the same class once, right? So I'm going to adapt to the uh, and, and it was true for my evaluations in the class semester. Folks were liking discussions. I think what they were liking most about discussions in the last semester is they came in more confident. And those who wanted to better explain themselves in writing and through less than hypothesis were able to do so. And those who felt more confident being kind of shrouded behind before class or even after class, because that was a cool thing to see, was how we were done reading, a particular reading, like weeks ago. And people are still commenting on it. People are still having active and lively conversations. And because I didn't know we already in class, students had access to these materials forever. And so not only did they have access to their comments and annotations because of the web, but also the materials themselves. And so they keep going back and referencing them. If they found that they really had a nice, structured, interesting conversation, they keep going back to it. And that's, and that's what we want in educational resources, right? We want to make more apps and other things that are So um, those are the sorts of things that I saw. And it, it just, it really called into question how much weight I think we often get to think about participation and whatever that means, whatever that looks like. That's the thing. Hi, yeah, I'm John Stewart. Um, my role is more from the, I guess, administrative perspective. I'm the assistant director for the Office of Digital Learning. And a lot of what I do is try to help faculty understand new tools and integrate them into their classes and help them think through what can I do with the tool. And so with Hypothesis, I spend a lot of time helping people think about, um, you know, don't just, you know, have the students highlight the thesis and make that the assignment. How do we actually get them starting conversations uh, in the documents that they're annotating? And so a lot of it has been, how do, I, how do I meet with faculty? How do I work with faculty? How do I let them know about something that exists like Hypothesis? Uh, and so recruitment of faculty and, and integration of these technologies into their classes is a big challenge for me. We do a lot of workshops and bring people in. And um, the model that has been more successful is sort of a, a champion model uh, for us. And so one of the early adopters of Hypothesis on our campus started three or four years ago and actually did a presentation with Jeremy at, um, at a tech uh, conference at OU. Uh, Nick Lordo integrated Hypothesis into his um, creative writing classes, into his expository writing classes. And so he was having his students both annotate the readings that they were working on and then also annotate each other's papers as they were turning them in uh, for peer feedback. And then from Nick's work, um, the rest of expository writing is now using Hypothesis uh, in their classes. And so we've got it uh, adopted at sort of departmental level. And, and then, then one of our other early adopters was uh, Dave Robel, who's a history professor. And he teaches Steinbeck a lot. His, his real passion, his research is on uh, Steinbeck and his novels. And so he had his students, again, marking up uh, these open editions of Steinbeck um, using Hypothesis and then writing their papers based off their notes. Um, and then luckily, I guess for us and Hypothesis adoption on campus, and luckily for us because Dave's great, uh, he became Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences right after he adopted Hypothesis. And so then helped to sort of promote it uh, to the rest of the faculty uh, through his own work. And so we see a lot of adoption in history and English and in philosophy, uh, polyscience. And, uh, and so a lot of my work is just how can faculty use these tools? And I'm constantly interested in talking to faculty to see what they're excited about, uh, what their ideas are for using the tool, things that I haven't thought of yet, uh, applications in STEM fields and engineering uh, that I just don't come across as much with my history background and history interests. Um, one, I guess, project though to focus on that's been uh, particularly interesting and successful, and especially the idea of it and the way that the, the faculty members integrated it, is a, a guy named Rafi Folsom, uh, who again teaches history has his students uh, take annotations, but then dumps all of the annotations uh, from all of their readings into a common pile. He uses the group feature and we extract all of the annotations and then share them and make sure that the students have easy access to all of the annotations. And then he encourages the students to write their research papers, drawing on not only their own research, but the research of everybody else in the class. And some of the findings that these undergrad, you know, usually junior level students are making um, are outstanding because they're actually working with a research team of 30 people all focused on uh, a set of topics that are a little bit varied and their, their individual papers that they'll write are a little bit different. Um, but one student was focused on, it, the class is a, a history of um, Spanish borderlands, so sort of colonialism, uh, South America, uh, all of the Americas really. 
Um, so anyway, one of the students was interested in uh, gender dynamics in these Spanish borderlands, and she was looking at how um, family structures are made and really how marriage, the marriage process works uh, in these readings that they were doing. And so she found several of, of her own readings that were interesting, several of her own notes. But when she started noticing a pattern, she then could go through all of the notes by all of the other students and look at where they talked about gender. Maybe they weren't talking about marriage in particular, but she could pull from their notes on what they were seeing and then go back into the sources that she hadn't herself read. The students had all been reading different documents. And so she could go back into the primary sources that they were reading from and then do her research. And she ended up finding that uh, women actually were the dominant force in marriage politics in these communities that she was uh, looking at, that the women chose their partners, which was a really interesting finding that hadn't been made anywhere in the history in the literature for that field of history. And so it was a novel finding that would be, you know, sort of great work for a master's or a PhD in history, but she was doing it as just her junior paper. And it was because she was working with a research team of 30 other students and a research leader uh, as the instructor. And so I really liked that idea of not only using hypothesis to model how, how, how to read, but how to do research and then open up the idea of how we do research and stop acting as single actors uh, in history and in poly science and in these other fields where traditionally the humanists have been, uh, you know, a solo author on all of their papers. And so we're trying to model this new idea of open research, open scholarship using hypothesis. Uh, and I've been really excited about that project. And we're trying to model what would a, what would a history lab look like uh, in the same way that a bio lab looks like? You know, what would it look like if we had multiple postdocs and multiple, you know, graduate students and whole classes of undergrads all thinking about uh, the same concepts and reading, you know, hundreds and thousands of documents in a way that no individual could. Um, and again, annotation makes that possible. So a couple of our projects are particularly exciting. I think Hypothesis is currently being used by maybe 10 classes that I know of, and then however many classes can figure it out on their own without asking me about it. Um, and so we've got a pretty good user group on campus, and I'm constantly trying to use Hypothesis to push OER, to push open pedagogy, to push uh, open research, uh, and just sort of openness in general. So anyway, a couple of ideas. Um, happy to talk about any of those or anything else. So thanks. John, quick, quick sort of hypothetical that you can, or anyone can react to maybe, but uh, the like interoperability is is huge, and and I mean it's the sort of underpinning that I think everyone values in what hypothesis represents. Uh, if you have like endless time, either you or or others who have an interest in data. You could just devote like all your time to making use. I mean, you have good examples of how that, uh, you know, being able to dig into the actual data and, and how that could create these novel experiences on the student side. If you had like all the time in the world, you could just do that. What do you see, or, or what sort of like systemic changes could really be enacted uh, with enough annotation happening again, you know, across the university? Any thoughts on like how far you could go if, if you just had endless time to dig in and, and um, you know, sort of create these supplementary tools. How far can the university go in, in really shifting broadly, culturally, like big, big things? How far do you think we can go? Yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, the, one of the ways I was thinking about it as I was sitting here earlier was not so much interoperability at scale, but interoperability between the systems. And so I love that Hypothesis has its API and that it's fairly easy to, to pull annotations from the Hypothesis. And that's particularly nice in terms of interoperability because for as great as hypothesis is, and as much as we can annotate everything, we can actually annotate some stuff that isn't, you know, digitized. Yet. And so some of the other annotation systems that we have uh, focus on archival materials. And so I've got a database where students are taking notes from the archive and putting them into uh, a database, and then again sharing those annotations with each other in the class uh, based off of primary things that, that you can't use hypothesis on. But because you can use hypothesis and because you have the API, you can then mash those two systems together, and you can have annotation tools that work on game or anything. Uh, video, I guess, would be the next one. And so inter interoperability with visual, non-textual media uh, would be, I guess, the next step. So interoperability between systems is key. Uh, and then, yeah, at scale, having multiple students you know, from one class working on a project. But you can imagine a, a sort of diachronic uh, research project that would go through multiple classes, maybe as the students progress. On multiple levels of, you know, you've got a freshman intro to uh, colonial American history and a senior level capstone, both working on projects at the same time, many different groups, possibly spread out over multiple semesters, 
all share your notes. Uh, there's a really good example of that in history of science where a, a, a group of students in a class over the course of like six classes, uh, those, those six classes of students all work together in textbook on the history of, uh, of chemistry and uh, chlorine, history of chlorine and, and substance. And so you can think about diachronic uh, projects where students are sharing notes over the course of two or three years and multiple classes and you know, the types of research that you can do. Or in between classes, you know, the history of poli sci or something. One of the cool things that came to mind as you were talking about sort of <clears throat> increasing uh, you know, institution level adoption, or at least you know, department level adoption, is you know, what would it look like if history of the University of Oklahoma was, you know, almost every course was using it, or it's more of the composition courses, as you mentioned. And then, especially since our composition majors or history majors, following that learning record, you know, the sort of portfolio of, uh, of interactions that, that Jonathan brought to mind, but across courses throughout one's you know, tenure in a discipline, disciplinary training at a, in a particular department uh, would be really neat. Yeah. But on that front, uh, just one way that I think that might happen for us, and again, just the interesting way that hypothesis is spread, was that our champion in the history department, uh, both the dean, but then also right now our graduate student, who really wants all of the graduate students to uh, implement hypothesis in the classes whether the professors like it or not. Really, is this because Anna? she likes it. What's up? This Anna? Yeah. Yeah, it, because she likes it so much as a grading tool or as a tool for working with students. And so it's likely that graduate students as a group, because of TAs, will end up making that change. Uh, and then you can see sort of how it works in the project. So that's it. Sure. So I have a question that's a, a little bit off topic, but because you're kind of coming from the administrative side, I'm wondering what are the um, maybe the pros and cons in terms of like accessibility. Um, also, in, I was thinking just about if you're really doing it, the more robust the conversation, that's a good thing, but it also means a lot of text to sift through. So I'm thinking about students that have cognitive disabilities, that have um, brain injuries, those types of things. So um, can anybody speak to how, you know, this uh, ways they've seen that it's worked really well for those students or ways that it's not well? I don't know if that question is general too. Yeah, I don't have a great answer on that one. <laughs> <laughs> so mine has just been based on experience. Um, and actually, Nate and I were having a conversation about this back in the fall. Um, one thing I appreciate is I, I vet vendors a lot as part of my job. Um, I think, I, I don't know where you all are at now with the progress of like VPAS and everything else, but at the time, uh, I was reviewing hypothesis, and what I appreciate is how exceptional is they had a page that had this whole rationale about their philosophy on accessibility and meeting that compliance level. And I, I have not seen that in the head tech realm. I really appreciate that one. Um, but, but two, regardless, I, a tool like hypothesis, when my students are going through, because I, I, have, I have taught students in classes, right? Brain injuries and disabilities. Um, it's a writing intensive class, and so to presume that everyone can write the same amount at the same speed and the same pace is highly problematic. Uh, and so, furthermore, as I was kind of describing the, the contract rating and the fact that students need to you know, compile and reference and reflect on their own contributions to the class, that's not about quantity necessarily. Quality, that there is something that should be measured there. So the fact that you have a tool where maybe it's just chunking information just briefly, uh, they're having a more engaged experience, or maybe an experience that better accommodates their own needs as a learner. Then if I was to say, okay, I expect you all to read the same you know, 40 page article, and some of the things to say, each of you have like three questions and three comments. And, and so that level of flexibility, it's to me as someone who works with faculty and talks with them often about pedagogy and thinking about accommodating their students. That's a conversation point that helps illustrate the need to be adaptive, the need to think about you know, not truly individualized instruction, but how contingencies exist within these courses. So, um, from a like social responsibility standpoint, that's great. But I also know that we can fund the report with accessibility. That's from the
I'm showing particularly inspired questions of today. Kyle might be following you this vision for a time. And, and he's, of course, a, a huge proponent of and practitioner in the DSM 6 space. Um, and that's a separate kind of story if you're not familiar with DSM 6, but, but having, having taught and played around with that course for a number of years now myself, it's taught me that the idea of a robust discussion is not necessarily text heavy. And so I would just kind of also kind of just feed that back in terms of your question. Because I, I, I also share many of your uh, you know, queries and thoughts around what, what counts as a robust discussion. But as I've played around with hypotheses in my own teaching, um, I try and have my students think critically about what makes a discussion robust. Does it need to just be a lot of text? Or can it be many other things? And so in addition to, I think, John, thank you so much for pointing out the hypothesis is done proactively around aspects of accessibility. I've had students, for example, who have recorded responses and then put an audio file on SoundCloud and then just put it as a link into an annotation. I'm not saying that that's like, you know, the best workaround in the world, but I am suggesting that I think there are ways that you might think about meeting students where they are in terms of the modality that they perhaps prefer. I'm actually not making an argument for learning styles. I'm a learning scientist and it's not like that. But I am suggesting that I think you can say to some students, there are visual ways, perhaps, and audio ways, perhaps, that, that we can explain some of that if we do have a hypothesis discussion on a time And then what does that mean for a robust conversation? Um, one of the things that I'm bumping into is the research thing, which I'm already going to go back. Another thing with accessibility that I'm really interested in in the future in my own, own world is how I consume information and how my daughters consume information. And it's gone from you know 17-inch monitor pretty much every day, all the time, on my phone. And I mean I got the iPad, I got my hair, you know, I, mean, I got all kinds of devices, <laughs> but my tool of choice is becoming slowly more and more on my phone. And I don't know where we're gonna be in 10 years, but I'm pretty sure it's gonna be less than that. Bigger than that. And, and I worry or I wonder how hypothesis and other tools that lay on top of the web will, how they will be in the future on the phone and the Coming on with that thought, stand in the air as Remy and Francisco step off to the stand. I will say that I am really unhappy now because my computer is being used as the, you know, Podium computer, and I'm having to tweet from my phone, <laughs> which is, I now have like the biggest phone possible, and I'm still just like, I'm stressed out about it, but I want, I want my keyboard. So, long live the keyboard. We're going to need you to stand a little more. Oh, so right, come here, man. Uh, come here. Two people are still so, <laughs> that's right, because we we're looking right here. So, very briefly again, I'm Rami Kalir. Francisco Perez. And we cheated, and we actually included slides in the deck. So, I'm going to quickly show this. Give one little bit of background and then turn it over to Francisco, which is that, uh, as I've mentioned now, I've been teaching with Hypothesis for a number of years. I've actually also been helping to co-facilitate a public uh, series of conversations about educational equity. It's called Marginal Syllabus. Perhaps it's a separate conversation. But in these various contexts of annotation conversation, I would always have questions like, who's in the document? And what are they adding? And is it an annotation or is it a reply? And what's the collaborative thread? And kind of what's going on here? And that over a series of conversations and Francisco's expertise led to a tool that we call crowd layers. That's it, man. It's all you. <laughs> so um, this, this project started um, when we were looking at analyzing the data. And we started thinking of ways to um, productionize this an, the analytic process. So getting the analysis off of my laptop and you know, sharing that process with others. Um, and I think one of the best ways to um, explore uh, a data set is through visualizations. And so we've developed this, uh, this, uh, this tool that, uh, that visualizes interactions at the document level. Right now we're working to expand it to um, the group level and then uh, later on to other, other different contexts. Um, so if you want to um, explore you know, interactions at the document level through annotations, um, I think we, we built this tool so you can 
get a cursory uh, view of these uh, of uh, these annotations. So so we provide you visualizations for that. Um, our next step, I think, is pretty exciting. Um, we're going to start using more advanced analytics, um, you know, like like machine learning, um, to dive deeper into um, the data that's already there. And then um, we'll also start using um, um, artificial intelligence to um, augment, um, you know, through your understanding of some of the processes that are going on, um, whether it be through uh, natural language processing or, or um, modeling of, of, of the conversations that are, that are happening at this space. So um, we're, that's, our, that's our next step and I'm kind of excited about that. So, and, and this is an open tool, so if anybody wants to use it, you can just visit the site. And so, so there's the website. There's crowdlayers.org. Again, it's a long acronym that you can read about when you go to the website. Um, but this is our second slide. And again, we cheated. The, the screenshot, again, you could go there live right now. This is a URL that's been put into the dashboard. Again, it's an open dashboard. Uh, if you recognize the Atlantic and then there's a magazine thing, backslash, and you might see in that URL there, as we may think. And for many people who are familiar with collaborative annotation, there's a very famous essay from the 1940s, I believe. Is that right, Jeremy? 40s, yeah. Um, by Vannevar Bush about um, a kind of memory extension device that he calls the Memex. It's often credited as being one of the antecedents to not only the web, but how we think about collaborative knowledge construction. And so this is a really seminal piece in the history of the internet and also annotation. And there happened to be 308 annotations on that particular document by 65 people. A lot of those 308 are actually by Jeremy, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, you have 45 collaborative threads. There have been 44 days of active activity over many years. And if you were to take this URL right now and paste it into crowd layers, it gives you those real time analytics. And as Francisco mentioned, again, this is a kind of basic descriptive approach to the statistics. Again, a kind of social learning analytics, our next steps are again to go deeper. So again, you've got this in your slides. Again, there's the URL, but we'd love to just answer some questions around what kinds of data-driven insights might be useful for you, whether you're an administrator working with many faculty across multiple course contexts, or teaching single classes, or teaching large classes, or small classes, or whatever they may be. And so perhaps that can guide some of our, our Q&A. I just want to make a quick point, like a verbal sticky note, uh, to sort of point out where we've come from Anne's presentation, right? Where she was really, you know, the thing I love about what you're seeing is the intimacy of the conversation and the sort of presence of the community of the classroom. And, you know, you being there with students going back and forth, learning about their lives in the context of learning is sort of the sort of close reading, not in the classic English literature sense, but everybody's on a text together in a very powerfully intimate Way. And that's one of the great things about hypothesis. But I think the work that Francisco and, 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 and Ramey are doing, I would call it a sort of kind of distant reading of those conversations um, that has other insights, right? You learn about things from your students by literally replying to their annotations and reading their annotations. But stepping back and seeing what they've done over the course of the text also gives you insights into how they're learning um, and also how, how they're interacting with your, the text that you've chosen and your teaching and things like that. So I think this distant view is, is equally important and is really an emergent one because this is, you know, pioneering work that they're doing. I thought this doesn't have its own tool set that allows people to have this kind of perspective. Um, these guys are building it and um, learning from it already. Thanks. thanks. Yeah, that's what we got. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to get yeah, no, thanks. Data. Yeah. What, what would you want from the data annotation? I think your question is right? Well, yeah. Do, 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 yeah. <clears throat> Just wanted to give a, a shout out to the hypothesis team and, and this is real credit to uh, their commitment. Um, I think John mentioned that they have this API where you can gather um, the annotation. That's what, that's what this is based on. And, and, uh, the hypothesis team has really been, uh, um, they've, they've really been committed to um, collaboration. And that's the only way we could have built this is, is if they, they did all the groundwork for this. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. This is something that we should all revisit and then follow up with Rami and Francisco, but I will take the opportunity to move us along. Move us along. Here for the final uh, catalyst, whose name was belatedly added to the list here, but
but now is officially there with the, his university spelled correctly. I don't know if you saw Nate and I refreshing a few times, um, but now Michael McGarry will uh, be our last person to share one. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm Michael McGarry. I'm from Cal State Channel Islands. Um, I come from more of the administrative side as well. I'm the instructional technology lead for our campus. Um, so basically I oversee our LMS and all of our other learning technologies on campus, make sure that all the bolts and gears are still firing. And when, you know, faculty have stuff that stops breaking, they get to come yell at me. Um, <laughs> so we just actually actively are running a pilot at Channel Islands with Hypothesis. Um, we had kind of sort of tried to integrate it into um, some curriculum stuff and into our LMS previously. Um, and there were some clunky bits that didn't work so well. So it wasn't met with a great reception, but we also didn't really push for it all that hard. Um, with some of the newer uh, kind of functionality and stuff that Jeremy and all the great people at Hypothesis have done with that integration, namely the main one that was kind of the savior for us to use is the fact that it doesn't require students to create another account anymore. That was the big hang up for a lot of our instructors. There's enough accounts and enough tools and enough everything already out there that that was enough of a speed bump to have them just not want to use it. Um, so now that that's gone, um, it can just load up directly as an assignment. The interface loads up clean. You know, it take, it's course aware, it's user aware. Um, we were able to kind of get a group of faculty together. And we're fortunate at Channel Islands that our team, um, I'm part of the Teaching Learning Innovations team, which there's gonna be a whole gaggle of us here, so come find us uh, throughout the event. Um, we have a lot of faculty, what we call fellows, um, that we bring on with our team because it's, we don't want it just to be a group of designers and administrators, which I mean, we, they, all, the team that I have, they work, they do amazing work. But without the insight from the faculty, um, it's kind of, it could get misguided very easily. So we work really closely with a core group of faculty and through them, we were able to get a solid group of faculty together for this pilot. So we have 15 or 16 people um, from a pretty good grab bag of disciplines. We have some from STEM, we have history represented um, and a large group of composition folks, which was kind of the natural grab for us, um, but we were able to put all of them together. And so we started at the beginning of the semester um, with just an onboarding where Jeremy kind of explained what Hypothesis was, got faculty kind of excited about the tool and what it could do in terms of social annotation and people's eyes just kind of lit up at the idea that they're like, yeah, we already do stuff like this, but we want to do it on an online space. And you know, it, this provided that kind of pathway. Um, so we're, I'm very interested after hearing everybody speak, like I'd love to hear the analytic piece and get that one. I'd love to see something like that in the hands of our faculty and see what kind of questions they bring up. I'm very much the kind of person that kind of just likes to lay these things out and then see what kind of questions our faculty come up with. Um, so right now we're coming towards the end of the semester. So we're gonna be doing some evaluation metrics from them um, to see what worked with the tool, what didn't work with the tool. Um, ideally, want to get some feedback from the students as well to see what kind of hangups there are um, from the student end. Um, but throughout this entire pilot so far, we made it as low stakes as possible. We made it so basically the requirements for our faculty were use the tool once, you're going to have to do this evaluation metric, um, and then meet with Jeremy at some point just to give some kind of insight into what's working, what's not, what are some things that you'd like to see done differently. Um, and we've had a few of those and um, Jeremy's been invaluable in being able to meet directly with our faculty, but so is the entire support team. Anytime anything's come up, I can just fire something off, be like, I don't know the answer to that question, let me find out. Um, and everybody knows this is a pilot space, so it's been really, um, it's been a really positive experience so far. But like I said, it's not over yet. So I don't, we don't have any of the data or any of the kind of metrics or anything to really explain. But um, the way our team works and the way this pilot's going, it's been really fun. I think we're gonna kind of use this model for future pilots in terms of gathering people and using that kind of group. It's been, it's been great so far um, and I'm excited to see where it goes. So that's all I, all I got. And Michael, you uh, mentioned that you have this uh, grab bag of different disciplines. Have they um, talked to each other yet, or are they planning to talk to each other and kind of share across disciplinarily what they're doing? Yeah, so that's part of what we ideally at the end of the semester, we want to get the entire what we're calling a cohort, basically all the pilot faculty back together and kind of have that group conversation. Um, 
I'm definitely interested just from my position and our team's position to see how the different disciplines are using them. Cause obviously there's different kinds of assignments that go with each one. Like I said, like composition and reading and English and stuff like that, it, it was a very logical step. I didn't even think of having like how it could be used in STEM classes, but the fact that we have one or two in there, I'm really interested to see how that's going. So we, again, since we're still in the pilot, we haven't done it yet, but that is the idea to get that at the end. So my um, my boss Jill Lee said, who isn't here, unfortunately, she we went through we just did an LMS transition two years ago. We went from Blackboard to Canvas, and we set out with a pilot but we called it a pilot with intent to adopt very early on. Um, and we learned a lot through that process of basically being as transparent as possible when we brought something on board. Um, so it wasn't, it, it wasn't really framed so much as like, yeah, we're going to test this out. And if it sucks because one or two of you don't like it, we're going to get rid of it. It was kind of the opposite. It was like, if you guys don't have a full blown revolt, this is going to be something that you get to you guys get to use. I mean, granted, the LMS was a little different because that was a full replacement for an entire campus. This is a tool that you can use. Um, but that kind of basically just providing a clear plan from the beginning so the expectations were set from the very beginning. It made it very uh, easy for the faculty to come on board and be like, okay, I can do that, I can do that, I can do that, sign me up. So it made it pretty easy. Um, to answer your question about our faculty fellows, that process has evolved over the years. Um, it was just kind of faculty that we were close in contact with. And then now the way that it stands, it's actually an application process where we reach out to, we basically put a call out and say, um, you know, to our faculty, they do get um, time release for doing it. So they have to come and present a uh, project that they want to do with our team. Basically they run the whole project and we're just kind of there to support them as best we can. Um, and we go through all the applicants to see which ones work and kind of sort of line up with what we're working on already and which we feel would be a good fit. Um, and we go from there. I need to get into one of those classes, one of those classes in Canvas, mm -hmm. so I can see it when functioning mm -hmm. in Canvas and what would be super awesome like what you are hypothesis is into that class and maybe interact with one or two of your people or you know whoever you've got in mind but that's a great way to sell the product is to hear successful stories from your place over at our place right, right. That, that are actually moving conversations mm -hmm. not just from other right so, and one of the things i didn't <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, certainly, certainly glad to share all the findings and everything. I'm sure there's, we'll put a, we're going to be putting a blog post together. I'm sure after the end of this is put together, kind of wrapping it up. Um, one of the other things that was really valuable through the LTI is the fact that you can actually grab files that are in the class. So they don't have to just be, you know, publicly shared articles and stuff. You can grab those PDFs and readings that the students are already having to read and go through in the course and then directly work with those. And it also synced up with Google Drive, so we're great. Thank you, Michael. Thank you to the rest of our panelists. Uh, that was really wonderful. <laughs>